Good evening, everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your busy day to join us for this webinar. My name is Siwan Howerton, and I'm a dairy scientist at AHDB Dairy. I'm delighted to bring you tonight's webinar on reintroduction of grazing for dairy cows on a mixed farm in northern Germany. Our presenter today is Ralph Loggs from Germany. Um, tonight's webinar is being delivered as part of the Europe Dairy Network. This network includes 14 countries from Ireland to Poland and Sweden to Italy. It aims to put farmers at the centre of practice based innovations by sharing knowledge and solutions. You can find more out about Eurodairy by visiting www.eurodairy.eu. Tonight's webinar has proven very popular with nearly 110 registrations from dairy farmers, vets, nutritionists, consultants and researchers from 12 countries right across Europe. Ralph will run through his presentation, which will take around 30 minutes, and there will be time for comments and questions at the end. You will all stay muted throughout the webinar, but if anyone would like to ask a question, then please type your questions into the box on the left-hand side of your screens. I will ask Ralph your questions at the end of his presentation. We will aim to finish up within the hour. I would like to thank our digital manager, Elena, who is working behind the screens to endeavour to keep this webinar running as smooth as possible. But do please bear with us if we encounter any technical difficulties, but we'll try and keep these to a minimum. So without further delay, I'm delighted to introduce our speaker for tonight. Ralph is a senior scientist at the Faculty of Agriculture and Nutritional Sciences of the University of Kiel, Germany. He works in the Grass and Forage Science and Organic Agriculture Department in the University. He has 20 years of research experience in the field of forage production and organic agriculture. His research interests include low-cost cap grazing production systems, the nitrogen cycle, especially in the estimation of nitrogen gas fixation by legumes, nitrogen leaching and the nitrous oxide emissions. Previously in his career, Ralph spent two years working in practical ag agriculture through the German vocational training programme, which gave him the opportunity to work on both Danish and English dairy farms. So without further delay, it's over to you, Ralph. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Welcome everybody to this webinar on which we carry out in the framework of the Euro Dairy Project which uh, has its focus on innovations in dairy science. And I want to welcome uh, you. Uh, thank you for giving me the possibility to present uh, our innovation project, an innovation project from Germany closely related to an EIP, an European Innovation Partnership Project with the name Smart Grazing. Uh, on the second slide, uh, you can see uh, me to, to know who is <laughs> talking to you and where I am located. Here's the map of Germany in uh, the middle and in the north of Germany, we have the state of Schleswig-Holstein. And uh, to the right, uh, you see uh, Kiel. Kiel is the capital of Holstein. You might could know our cows uh, running around in the whole world. And uh, a little bit above, uh, there is the Lindhof, very close to the Baltic Sea, where our <coughs> innovation project is carried out. Um, why? Uh, being interested in a revival of grazing. Of course, I was introduced uh, as an environmental scientist. From the viewpoint of an environmental scientist, uh, we see that the recent intensification in European dairy production has raised environmental and sustainability questions about current housing systems. Keywords in this background are animal welfare, resource efficiency, and of course the energy demand. And uh, especially now in Germany also, we are talking about the carbon footprint of milk and meat production. 
and uh, biodiversity, uh, which are the things uh, where we see a lot of potential for farms uh, that uh, do graze or that reintroduce grazing. Um, we can see uh, real interests in uh, um, milk from grazing. There had been studies uh, on, for undertaken asking German customers uh, what they take into account when buying milk. And uh, at least that's what they say in surveys if they uh, really make their decision uh, depending on it, we have to see. Uh, it's a, a thing in Germany that uh, milk should be, uh, it's, it's very important for a lot of customers that it is free from uh, genetic technologies, but already 50%, 51% want that the cows are out on fresh grass. Some will, of course, uh, prefer milk from their own regions. Of course, the milk price is one uh, very important thing. And just 10% really uh, have the demand that it should be produced uh, organic. So that led to the point that milk uh, from cows out of grass uh, are becoming a new niche product in Germany. The big German discount stores like Aldi and Lidl have started listing a special product, pasture milk, where the minimum requirement is that the cows are out on grass at least six hours per day for 120 days. Um, for those who might not know, for drinking milk, uh, GMO-free is close to become standard, even in the, uh, uh, the cheapest milk, for example, of the Lidl discounter. This is a potential we might use, at least those who think of uh, reintroducing or still are grazing. Uh, in 2017, 50 million liters pasture milk of this pasture milk have been sold in Germany. That's now equivalent to 2.5% of the whole market for drinking milk. This market is fast growing, at least with 40% alone in 2017. And in addition to this comes further 5% organic milk, uh, where grazing anyhow plays an important role. The problem, and this is now more from the viewpoint of a farmer, is that uh, at least here in uh, Germany or Northern Germany, uh, even with the actual very high milk prices for conventional milk of around 400 euros per ton of energy corrected milk, the production costs in Northern Germany are not covered. You can see it in this graph, which I just uh, translated halfway, actual ratio, uh, should be ratio of, of price and cost for milk production. Even in the comfortable situation of autumn 2017, uh, the production costs are higher than the actual milk price. But uh, when looking to uh, countries that graze uh, pasture, is considered to be the cheapest forage and why not making use of it. When looking at some Irish studies, for example, of Pat Dillon from 2008, we can see a strong relationship between the total costs of milk production and uh, the proportion of grazed grass in the diet where the highest production costs are in the confinement system. And of course, in some countries with quite a bit of delaying climatic conditions uh, like New Zealand or Australia and even Ireland, uh, the costs are much lower. Uh, somehow Germany um, uh, is in the middle part uh, where officially, at least at that point of time, 40% uh, uh, in the diet as of Christ grass, but this has changed uh, dramatically. Grazing is declining in Germany. Uh, looking on uh, the system uh, in, in Ireland or what the Irish does, 
is uh, very interesting from our viewpoint when you can see here in a survey from Ireland uh, that uh, the um, milk price still is higher than the production costs with one exception of 2009. So uh, even in years with very low milk prices like we had here in Germany, uh, Irish colleagues earn money and they uh, that made us uh, very interested in how they do. Of course, taking into account that they might have different climatic conditions. Um, in Irish studies like this one, uh, where the costs per Irish uh, uh, energy unit are presented, uh, grazed grass, is considered uh, to be much cheaper than grass silage taking uh, in system where one cut is undertaken and then possibly grazing uh, and uh, compared of course also to silage and uh, compared to uh, the concentrate which are the uh, most uh, cost effect uh, uh, costs uh, costly uh, for it uh, fodder for dairy cows and uh, especially when you later on hear that i'm talking about an example from an organic farm here concentrates are as well very expensive but you will soon see how the situation is in germany also in Germany, there are surveys on the forage costs on dairy farms in southern Germany undertaken in 2014. And um, here, of course, we use the costs per megajoule netto energy lactations, which is the energy uh, usable for milk production. It's uh, uh, um, a special German forage unit, but that's what I wanted to show you that we all know in Germany that there is the possibility that grazed grass in green uh, is much cheaper than grass silage, uh, uh, also taking into account that not uh, only when grazing we have uh, rejected grass losses also taking into account that grass silage uh, from uh, harvest to be taken up by the cows uh, often loses 30% of its energy. But uh, from the situation here in Northern Germany, we did an own survey, survey undertaken on five farms with grazing here at Schleswig-Holstein. Um, where as well grass, grazed grass uh, varied in the costs between 0 0.5 cents and 1.8 cents per German uh, energy unit, uh, where the, we can for comparison say that the German energy unit is equivalent to uh, 1.62 megajoule metabolizable energy. But uh, compared to grass silage, uh, and depending on how effective the farmers were working on their uh, with their grazing, uh, grazed grass was cheaper for them, even taking all into account uh, maintenance of fences and everything. Uh, May silage, just taking into account the energy contents. Uh, was uh, even cheaper than grass silage, but we have to also to take into account that grass silage and grazed grass has more uh, protein than uh, the uh, than energy. So therefore, the net energy is not the only parameter to judge the costs of grazing. And then compared to the price of conventional concentrates we more or less have more than double the costs uh, per German energy unit. So um, with this as a background that uh, there is a potential of low forage costs uh, and then seeing that the customers really want to have milk from grazing, 
we on top uh, can see that uh, you even could earn a bit more money uh, when you meet the requirements for uh, to, to, to get uh, a certificated uh, uh, pr uh, producer of dairy milk, but the requirements uh, are very low compared to a full grazing systems. Uh, to get this certificate, uh, the German creameries, they want that the cows are 120 days on grass for at least six hours and that you have least have uh, 2,000 square meters per cow. So it doesn't really say a thing um, about the forage intake, but, uh, but this will give you extra payments of up to one cent per liter energy corrected milk. And of course, uh, because there's documentation needed uh, up to 500 euros per farm, uh, paid extra for documentations. And also the politicians, they want to have the cows out again in Germany. There is some pressure, especially after studies on animal welfare, at least the southern states in Germany, like Baden-Württemberg and Bayern, pay between 40 and 50 euros per cows on grass in summer. So um, just to introduce you to the traditional situation of uh, dairy farms in Schleswig-Holstein, uh, it's a survey done on 1,040 uh, analyzed farms. Uh, sorry, there was one. Uh, on average, to introduce you to the typical farm in uh, Schleswig-Holstein, of course, we have small farms and of course there are farms with 300 and 600 cows. On average, the farms have 129 cows and on average, the milk yield is around uh, 8,500 kilograms of energy corrected milk per cows and uh, around 1.1 million kilograms of milk production per farm. Uh, but just with uh, around uh, 3,300 uh, kilograms of milk from forage, which is very low, the rest is accounted uh, to be from concentrates. Uh, but taking uh, all the purchased or bought in uh, feedstuff into account, uh, these farms still have around uh, 12,500 kilograms of milk per area of forage production, but of course taking into account uh, that a lot of the energy comes from purchased food. Um, you see for the period of 2014-15 uh, uh, milk prices around uh, 34 cents per kilograms, but facing production costs of nearly 45 cents per liter is uh, a very difficult situation. Uh, I told you that uh, at the moment we have around 40 cents. So. Uh, at least for farmers that can graze, uh, we have to have a look uh, uh, on uh, what we can do with grazing. And then looking to the Irish systems and see uh, that we, with higher yields uh, in countries like Denmark, the Netherlands and Germany, uh, nearly have difficulties to cover the costs, uh, the Irish uh, carry out the system with moderate yields of 5,000 uh, kilograms. And that made us uh, interesting to have a look at it. And of course, uh, for those who don't know, but many of you uh, will know, let me please uh, short uh, introduce you to the system. The Irish system is of course that we uh, try to synchronize uh, the feed demand of the lactating cows uh, to the grass growth, which is the main forage resource. And that's of course possible with seasonal calving in early spring and letting the cows uh, dry off uh, in mid of December. And everything uh, that is uh, not needed directly for grazing 
is then uh, cut for silage uh, for winter, even on cuts uh, on fields that have been grazed former, before and after that. And to see uh, where we in our regions uh, are, we always hear about the very good climatic conditions in Ireland, but uh, we are from the um, uh, uh, winter mild area of northern Germany. You can see in this comparison uh, the uh, daily growth rates of uh, grass and grass clover. Um, the gray uh, curves uh, show the uh, uh, daily growth rates uh, measured at Solohead, which is an experimental research farm under uh, the Irish um, Advisory Service Chagask. And the black uh, line and the dark dots uh, show the daily growth rates at our organic uh, experimental station Lindhof. Uh, it's not from the same years at Lindhof. It's uh, the growth rates from 2014 to 2017 uh, measured with the system of Coral and Fenlon and in the same with the same uh, registration method uh, we are comparing the yields with solo head uh, uh, also from here from seven years uh, in the beginning of this uh, century uh, but the interesting thing is uh, how close we in reality are with our yield potential uh, taking into account that uh, on average we could have on offer 10.5 tons per hectare at an organic farm uh, in northern Germany. Uh, this is comparable to yields uh, realized at Solohead with uh, 150 kilograms. But of course, we are not reaching the yields uh, of uh, uh, paddocks or fields fertilized with 300 kilograms. Uh, so there is uh, some uh, yield gap, but of course, not all farmers in Germany are organic. Uh, the interesting thing is, and where the most dividing thing is, our growth period starts later. We don't have a Gulf Stream, and uh, in the um, uh, in the bottom of my graph, uh, you ha we have the cumulative growth uh, degree days, which shows that we are in early spring have a colder climate, but in reality and later in autumn, uh, we have uh, good and nearly better um, um, temperatures. And in the growing season, we nearly have the same rainfall, uh, especially uh, taking into account that the months where it rains much is June, July and August. And uh, of course, uh, now comparing the organic situation, uh, we of course have made some registrations uh, on uh, um, uh, three different um, conventional farms at Schleswig-Holstein. Uh, here in the green line, uh, it's the same pattern. Our grass growth starts later. But of course, when fertilizing also with 300 kilograms of nitrogen, uh, it starts a bit earlier. And then we can see that we really can uh, make uh, use of the growth potential uh, by using the same amounts. And then we end up uh, in the same uh, yield potential as uh, in Ireland. So there is potential to realize high yields from grazing. But uh, as I told you, the role of grazing in northern Germany is still declining. Unfortunately, since many years, no technical progress in grazing management has happened in Schleswig-Holstein. Advice is hard to get. And uh, the contrary situation is in Ireland. Uh, and why not importing knowledge from there? 
And this is the background for the here presented project. And this is also why it's a good, uh, according to my view, a good example and adopting knowledge from another country and transferring it to a situation uh, to avoid double research. The Irish system is, of course, as I explained to you before, when you have the forage area that at one point of the time you have surplus grass growth, which you then will take for silage cut. And as I told you, uh, the Irish colleagues are uh, mainly, uh, and, and, and nearly all of them, are spring calving. They have to get the cows uh, pregnant or inseminated uh, by late April and May and then the cows dry off. And we think that this system also fits to our view uh, point. Um, as I show you, of course, we have uh, the challenge to get it uh, synchronized to our conditions. Uh, here we have some different varying uh, growth curves uh, depending on the interval. Uh, how often we used uh, our uh, paddocks uh, every three weeks or every four weeks. And of course, uh, sometimes we have some drought problems, which we have to take uh, into uh, to account. Just to introduce you to our uh, climatic conditions, uh, on average, we have 780 millimeters of rainfall per year and an average temperature of 8.7 degrees. And we are on, loamy, uh, on sandy loamy soils. Um, the problem is, of course, especially um, when uh, here um, looking at uh, that there's not only the <clears throat> Uh, the growth uh, varying. Uh, also, we have to uh, get uh, the um, the supply of, of protein and uh, uh, and energy uh, related to the demands of the cows. And here you can see uh, the course of the crude protein contents in the different years. But please take into account, this is grass clover. Uh, we have quite low uh, uh, crude protein contents on offer uh, in uh, June, July. But later on, when the clover speeds up, we nearly have too much protein. But I come back to this later. With the energy, uh, it's the same situation as in an island. We have very, very high energy concentrations. Here I use uh, the megajoules metabolizable energy per kilogram of dry matter. A lot of energy to start with grazing and uh, then nearly a lack of energy uh, during summer, but uh, then uh, when the generative phase is uh, passed, uh, the energy concentration start again. Um, so our um, challenge is, of course, to uh, synchronize the, the daily growth of net energy uh, on our farm, doing it on 32 hectares to the cow herd's daily demand of energy. And uh, how we do, uh, this is just a kind of case study on an experimental farm. Our aim is to maximize milk production from grazing with a reduced input of concentrate feeding uh, of around 400 to 600 kilograms per cow a year. And how we do, it's an organic system, grazing of two years lasting grass clover lays. Uh, we have 44 hectares as part of a five years organic crop rotation on 118 hectares. So there's a lot of good pre-crop value for arable crops. Uh, so this is also an example for uh, mixed farming or the introduction of mixed farming. What we do is copying more or less a rotational grazing system uh, of Ireland after each milking allowance of fresh grass based on plate meter readings. 
and grazing starting really early from the beginning of March to the mid of November. Uh, seasonal calving uh, from beginning of February to mid of April. So far the herd size is 78 jerseys. We had to start with jerseys because it was not possible to import crossbreeds from Ireland. The veterinaries uh, from Germany, they didn't like uh, this because of the different status, but uh, we are on our way. And uh, our first calving has to be like it is in Ireland at an age of younger than 24 months which saves, of course, also a lot of silage feeding to the heifers. Um, we're working mostly on grass clover, lays, and we're also using multi-species mixtures, but uh, that's not uh, the real focus of this presentations. But we are self-sufficient uh, with concentrates. Sorry for two spelling uh, mistakes here. Uh, or three uh, even, uh, but uh, we grow our own triticale winter wheat and faba beans. We took jerseys as a starting point, but uh, in the second lactation, we started insemination with Irish black and white. In uh, So they were born uh, crossbreeds in 2017. And uh, if they come to calve, they will be then uh, crossbred with Norwegian reds. Uh, the jerseys are doing very well, and act the actual calving interval we got uh, reduced uh, to below one year. Of course, there are always a few uh, extremes, uh, but uh, the farm has also a farm shop, and minced meat is needed, and jersey meat is very good meat. Um, what we do is uh, copying the Irish system. We do rotational grazing and use the central tool is our rising plate meter. We uh, have uh, paddocks at a size of around two hectares. And each after each milking, uh, they just get offered um, an area which uh, meets uh, their demands. And uh, we try to um, meet a growing stage of uh, the more or less, a little bit less than the three leaf stage of uh, perennial ryegrass, which is an optimal, an optimum for energy yields. Uh, when grazing lower, we have a suboptimal yield potential. And when the grass is getting older, we have more rejection and decreasing forage quality. And uh, of course, we're using the feed wedge and try to synchronize uh, the forage demands. And when here uh, on this uh, slide, you see that a lot of uh, paddocks are on their way uh, at the same growth stage, we have to take some silage cuts in between, just like the Irish do. Here, I wanted to show you pre and post grazing mass of uh, dry matter uh, at a um, cutting height or grazing height of four centimeters um, during the season uh, of 2017, where we started grazing the 13th of March and ended in the 15th of November. Uh, of course, you still in offer, you can see uh, a little bit of the uh, of the growth rates. Uh, first uh, grazing in in March, we run very quick, but that's very good to uh, increase tiller density. But on average, we offered uh, uh, twelve. Uh, sorry, it's uh, now I get a little bit uh, um, I lost. Uh, there's this. Uh, um, must must be uh, sorry. Is, uh, I'm I'm a little bit 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 lost. Uh, it's uh, it's then 1.2 uh, tons of uh, um, of uh, pre grazing, and um, the residuals are um, 0 0.34 tons, uh, which uh, gives us a forage use 
efficiency of 72 percent so most of the grass is rejected uh, is is is, uh, is is taken and uh, and below 28 percent are rejected and uh, of course uh, that was just the dry matter but you know we have selective grazing and when you have a look at an average of our different seed mixtures before uh, grazing, pre-grazing, we offered an energy, con energy concentration of 6.8 German megajoules. Seven is what you offer in a total mixed ratio. So we offer uh, less uh, on the fields, but taking into account that there is uh, selective grazing in the residuals you have less energy concentration and at on average uh, using a four weeks interval we offer we have an intake the same energy concentration as you would have in a total mixed ratio and the same is with the crude protein contents um, we have uh, on on average an offer uh, over the whole year of 20.8% uh, uh, of crude protein in the rejected um, uh, biomass. Uh, we have less than 18% of crude protein, but in the material, the dry matter that is eaten, we have more than 20 five uh, percent of crude protein which nearly is a bit much um, our challenge is of course there is a lot of uh, crude protein which uh, for our german understanding where we focus on having milk urea contents of around 150 kilograms when a conventional uh, system we had to learn that uh, milk urea contents of above 300 are possible, but uh, the cows uh, are doing well. And as I showed you, uh, the calving interval is very, uh, very uh, short. So we learned to live with this, but of course, too high milk urea contents led to that we uh, don't, uh, um utilize the protein good enough and maybe waste some energy uh, for getting uh, protein brought uh, um, breaking down to urea and therefore our consequence is that we start to allow two to three kilograms of wheat as concentrate feeding from july on but this is not shown in this graph from 2016. That was our uh, consequence for 2017. And uh, the last results before I sum up with yields is uh, taking then cuts for silage uh, in, for example, 2016, uh, where we took uh, silage cuts on the 15th of May, where we had already one grazing, we ended up uh, with energy concentrations of 11.6 um, megajoules utilizable energy or the German 7.1 uh, megajoules of NEL. This is silage uh, which is comparable to uh, a, a total mixed ratio but the reason is we are not harvesting the mass we have to take uh, the surplus in a stage where we normal, normally graze but this gives us very rich opportunity to feed the cows in the first phase of the lactation and the same happened also, for example, with the silage in 2017, where we even uh, realized uh, slightly higher energy concentrations. And uh, this with crude, root, uh, crude protein contents of 
So um, I think we have quite a good potential for feeding the cows in the first phase. To sum up, um, on the system, we used 21 uh, paddocks and uh, each paddock was at least uh, um, uh, taken uh, cuts for silage making one time and uh, then uh, allowed to graze it eight to 10 times per year uh, with uh, where the cows just stayed on one to two days uh, following the fence. And then when the paddock is empty, they move to the next. And um, as I said, we offered uh, in the start of the lactation and the end of the lactation up to two, three kilograms of concentrate feeding, uh, ending up with 620 kilograms of concentrate feeding per cow and year. And silage only was supplemented in the initial phase of the lactation from February until April, and then from mid-October until the end of the lactation, uh, when in these two parts of the lactation, the cows were just grazing for only half a day or less. Now uh, to some uh, important figures. Um, in total, we had uh, to offer our cows around one ton of dry matter of high quality grass silage. Uh, to, to the cows during lactation. Uh, under dry cow management, we feed less energy rich and less clover rich uh, silages. And uh, we found that 68% uh, uh, of our milk came from grazed grass and ending up with 10.6 tons of solid corrected milk or 994 uh, uh, kilograms of milk solids per hectare um, with uh, around 430 kilograms of milk fat and protein as milk solids per jersey cow. And uh, to have some target values to compare with, uh, of course, this is lower than uh, in the Irish system which is uh, as uh, where for conventional farmers, uh, the target values are set to 1,200 uh, kilograms of uh, milk solids per hectare. But we, from our starting point, definitely matched uh, the 820 kilograms of milk solids under an organic systems in Ireland. So um, the uh, economic results, uh, I can't show you too much, but I'm also running a little bit out of time. But uh, taking into account, especially the situation of very high prices for organic milk uh, during the last two years compared to the conventional uh, prices made it uh, very, economic sound system, taking also into account uh, that there had been subsidies for organic farming. And uh, we nearly didn't buy in anything. We were self-sufficient. Uh, my uh, facet will be uh, that grazing in Northern Germany has high potential. We now showed it for an organic system, but uh, in an upcoming and uh, hopefully granted new European Innovation Partnership project. We want to focus on conventional farms. Uh, seasonal calving is quite new for Germany. It has been there a hundred years ago. And uh, one opportunity, uh, especially high yielding conventional farmers in Germany take is autumn or late autumn calving. And, uh, but of course, uh, we have to collect new uh, knowledge on uh, grazing. And that's of course uh, why we wanted to uh, look and see what our colleagues does. And we already have scheduled uh, one trip for at least 30 farmers to Ireland to see how they do in the end of May. 
Uh, some of you might have seen this picture. It was the cover girls uh, of uh, the uh, February edition of uh, this uh, 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 journal of one uh, tractor company. Uh, this with the uh, green tractors and the yellow yules, uh, wheels that are our cows. And of course, in our project, we are focusing on the environmental factors. Uh, but that's maybe stuff enough for a new webinar. From now, uh, from here, I want to thank you for your attention and uh, uh, to use this uh, very fine uh, Dutch uh, slide, uh, we go outside again. Thank you for your attention. Great, thank you, Ralph. That was a very interesting presentation. Um, while I'm waiting for some questions to come up, and I'd just like to remind you that you can type these on the left-hand sides of your screens. Um, I'd also like to remind you that tonight's webinar has been recorded and will be available to watch back on the Euro Dairy website, along with other webinars from the last two years. So the first question tonight is from Roger. Um, and Roger's question is, why have you chosen jerseys and what effect does this have compared with Holsteins on methane emissions? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we, we just know that uh, the typical high yielding uh, uh, Holsteins uh, would not uh, be able to, to take up uh, enough energy uh, from grazing. So in our uh, attempt, uh, especially when an organic farm, we were interested in the Irish crossbreeds and uh, we nearly ordered them from Ireland, but uh, they were really ordered, but we couldn't get them to Germany. And then the next uh, uh, step was to find a very fertile breed which uh, can convert per kilograms of life weight uh, the most of energy. But the fertile uh, thing was very, very important. And it shows uh, that, um, that uh, they seem to, to cope. So uh, we, we try to, to have two different uh, groups to make in comparison and find out uh, what to do. But uh, of course, uh, methane production, we have to see. We are feeding very high energy, but uh, we already got granted a project focusing on methane emissions directly measured based on this SF6 method. Great, thank you. Um, Karen also has a question. Um, how will demand for winter milk be met if all cows are dry in December and January? Mm -hmm. That's the, the typical uh, question um, because uh, or, or one, one could think of, but uh, I just tried to produce, uh, present this as a kind of niche production. And um, uh, we, a lot of farmers uh, uh, have to focus on optimizing the, their farms with a lot of cows and don't have this area for grazing. They have to find different ways to reduce costs for milk production. There will always be, there will be no total shift and uh, the thing is, uh, the other opportunity is to have uh, uh, seasonal calving for high yielding cows uh, when autumn calving is. I nearly expected this question, but uh, I didn't really uh, uh, was managed to translate it uh, that you uh, use for high yielding cows uh the phase under controlled conditions during winter to use uh the yield potential and then just taking the last phase of the lactation period out on grass and autumn seasonal calving and spring seasonal calving will then manage that there always will be enough fresh milk 
Great, thank you. Um, so the next question is from Niall, and Niall is asking, are you collaborating with Chagas currently, and are there many commercial farms operating on an Irish system in Germany? Uh, we have uh, very close uh, contacts, maybe you have seen i hope it's an, uh, it's okay that i i uh, name my if i can call it my mentor it's it's james humphreys from chagas uh, he introduced us uh, to to the the system he is teaching also our students uh, in this system in a grazing module and uh, he's in charge of solar head farm and uh, there is this strong uh, cooperation and also in this Euro dairy network. But unfortunately, the system of seasonal calving has totally disappeared from Germany. It was the typical system for 110, 120 years ago. That was the natural system. Uh, but uh, so far, we have. Uh, uh, realized here in uh, Schleswig-Holstein uh, only three farms with uh, spring calving and we knew about some farms in the, our neighbor state Lower Saxony and of course there are a few farms which have focus on uh, autumn calving. Great, thank you. Um, Mark's question is did you have any bloating problems with high clover grazing? Uh, did I understand you? You, you mean bloat? Um, uh, we we were very very much aware of this, and that's why we uh, took the attempt of uh, a seed mixture. It's it's a lay farming system where we uh, also, uh, when uh, establishing the grass clover, take the red clover into it. Uh, there, the protein is uh, due to uh, polyphenol oxidases very stable but uh, in the end everything turns out that also on the permanent uh, pastures the white clover takes over but uh, then we make uh, a mix that uh, uh, when running this system uh, with, uh, we have a lot of uh, nitrogen going back to the to the fields from the grazing cows and the fields are getting grass rich in the second year so we uh, we shift from um, uh, that that we on daytime only graze the very clover rich fields when we have everything under control and nighttime grazing is then on uh, grass rich fields and we always offer in these situations uh, quite a rough hay during the period while the cows are waiting so so far uh, no losses uh, on bloat but i have been on a farm working with uh, 75 cows intensively grazing where i had to make the experience that suddenly 25 cows uh, had bloat uh, so the vet was very busy so i'm aware of this but we had no problems Great. Um, the next question from Grant is, what do you see the benefit of using an Irish type crossbred cow for this system over a single breed? Um, we, uh, we, we just knew that, uh, we, uh, that, that the main factor would be uh the, the the fertility that we can stuck uh into uh, in in this system where we uh, have uh, very young uh that the cows should be uh, mature very young uh, so that they really at an age of uh, a little bit above uh, 23 months so they start calving uh, in the the heifer start calving in in july in 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 late uh, january already that we feared uh, that uh, then later on in uh, later uh, lactations we we may have delays but uh, but now in this third uh, situation a uh, third uh, lactation uh, we still see that our jerseys are so fertile uh, so that we that our farm manager i'm just a scientific leader 
uh, really wants to carry on with the jerseys. But the problem with the jerseys is uh, what to do with the bull calves and therefore uh, the Irish uh, crossbreeds and they might, uh, um, they, they give uh, some more beef. Uh, we tried sex semen on the jerseys, but in our first year we had very bad results so that our starting point was with a very, very large uh, calving interval, which uh, we then uh, managed uh, to to get uh, with traditional insemination uh, and of course uh, for the second half of the herd we are using angus bulls uh, and that's of this uh, group where we don't want to use uh, the heifers for replacement great thank you ralph um james is asking are you milking once or twice a day so far, it's uh, it's twice uh, a day. Um, uh, I tried to talk uh, about uh, uh, different uh, situation uh, possibilities with our farm manager and uh, the staff at the experimental farm. Uh, that's I think it's a very very interesting uh, idea. We have. We have very, very high milk prices, uh, also due to the solids. Uh, we more or less said uh, 64, 66 cents per liter when delivery. And we have a very, very high standard for cell counts and microbials. So uh, uh, the creamery really wants our milk, so therefore, uh, the farm manager really wants to have everything under control, but we can see the economic benefits. And I mentioned it a few times, why not in the end of the lactation period, starting with uh, just uh, three times milking on two days and then the last part, just milking one day. Uh, we, we may uh, come up with it. Uh, and colleague farm here in Germany uh, tried it but he lost too much uh, milk yield. So we just have to ha have our own experiences, but, uh, uh, and, and look around and, and see uh, on uh, farms in uh, um, Great Britain or in, uh, in Ireland that uh, might use uh, just one time milking. Great, thank you. So the questions are flying in. And um, the next question is from Ray. You have been learning from the Irish. What have they learned from you? Oh, uh, that's a, a good uh, question, I, uh, Ray. Uh, it's 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 difficult. Uh, uh, they they have their con conditions, uh, and and maybe they 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 found the the optimal uh, systems. Of course, when milk prices go up, man might use a lot of, uh, uh, of, of, of concentrates there, but uh, we, we are in this apprentice stage. Uh, they maybe have, uh, have, uh, have, have seen that, that, uh, that we are quite good in, hopefully uh, good in copying the system and uh, that we uh, um, got our our good uh, re results there but uh, mainly it's the, the that, that that we uh, it's this one way we learned a lot uh, of of their system especially also what uh, it means with the uh, with the workload, uh, our herd manager suddenly has six weeks of holidays uh, mm -hmm. and uh, seasonal feeling that's good. And uh, our other co-workers working on a mixed farms, they can't do a thing in February. They might help with the calving. And when all calves are out, they can go and plow and make silage. So it's difficult <laughs> to to learn, uh, but 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 we will see. <laughs> Perfect. 
Um, unfortunately, ask this question, we are going to be out of time. But those that we haven't got to their questions, um, we will email you the answers. So the last question for tonight is from Tom. And Tom would like to know um, if you included any herbs in your lays, um, such as plantain or chicory, Ralph? Yes. Um, yes, yes, I did. Uh, that's, um, I'm sorry to, uh, that I jumped it over because I, I suddenly was, uh, was running uh, out of time. Maybe you, uh, you can see the, the slides where you still can see here in the middle our seed mixtures. That is uh, now a um, very uh, new research project. Uh, I actually uh, made the plan that our uh, fields uh, are now subdivided into two different mixtures, a traditional one without herbs and a mixture with these herbs also containing uh, tannin containing plants uh, like uh, the, uh, um, the birds for trefoil that would help us also with bloats. The chicory plays a good role. Uh, it's very good because in this organic system, it has its bits grows when the grass is uh, uh, is not so good in, in summer. And then there is the lancelot plantain and the caraway. So um, the productivity, uh, the material, the dry matter on offer is less but managing this very intensively, uh, the cows have less residuals. So that what the cows take up is uh, nearly the same amount. So we are very, very keen on following it. And hopefully we can find uh, an attempt to divide our herd and let them use uh, or graze uh, the different uh, fields. Um, parallel but uh, but we we have focus on it and it's a new project uh, it's uh, also a horizon 2020 project called susket where this is our duty great thanks ralph well unfortunately we are out of time but we will get back to those that we didn't get time to get to their questions and um, a big thank you to you all for listening we've had a great turnout and participation in this webinar now, please keep an eye out on the Eurodairy website, which is eurodairy.eu, for future webinars. A very special thanks to Ralph for taking time out of his busy day. The recording of this webinar will be available to watch back on the Eurodairy website in due course. All of you that have registered will receive an email to alert you when this is available. Thank you all and good night. Thank you all.